Ferry Circuit 30 years ago since Wayne Gardner won the 500cc motorcycle Grand Prix here. Can you believe it? Just under 4.5 kilometres around here. Average speed around 180 kilometres an hour. Top speed, a correction, 285 kilometres an hour. Pretty gentle on shock absorbers, pretty gentle on brakes. Unbelievably tough on tyres because of these long loads, sweeping corners. 210 corners in the middle of turn one, uh, 210 kilometres an hour. 120 kilometres an hour in the middle of two, 225 in the middle of three, so you get the picture. It really leans on that Dunlop rubber. Turn four, the hairpin, 75 k's, very slow. Down to five and six, where the long left-hander at Siberia loads up the right-hand side of the car. And then you start the run up towards Lukey Heights. This is a great corner here. Six and seven, flat, just, car teetering on the edge. They call it hay shed. And it is a beautiful corner. And then you rise up over the top, car gets all light, slides down the other side. Incredibly easy to lock a brake and make a mistake there. It's also a passing opportunity and the slowest corner on the racetrack. And then into the last corner, turn 12, having short shifted out of 11. Long, long, long road ahead down the front straight. Big speed here, about 80 metres a second in terms of peak velocity. And there you go, sixth gear, 285 kilometres an hour. Three sectors to talk about. The middle sector gets you from turn three to the top of Lukey Heights. Cars rolling out of the pit lane, right on cue. 45 degrees on the angle there, and out they go. In our earlier session today, practice one, Anton Di Pasquale, the fastest man from Will Davison and Rick Kelly, was just in the garage up there at Nissan. Pretty reasonable tyres on Rick's car, and uh, he was reasonably happy with the balance of it. Got on the podium on a couple of occasions last year. Scott McLaughlin was quick in the middle of the session. He ended up being fourth fastest from Shane Van Gisbergen, who's made a nice comeback from a championship standpoint after that dreadful run at the Australian Grand Prix where he had two of the four races, really didn't yield anything much in the way of an outcome for him. 24 degrees is the predicted top. And as I was coming back to the commentary box, check the phone, they're saying just a little over 23 degrees here at the moment. Light winds generally from a north-northwesterly direction, which is giving the cars some tailwind on the run to turn one. Bit of a headwind on the run into the hairpin at turn four. Mark Scaife has come back in from the host area to the commentary box, filled with lots of gossip, information, technical jargon. Good afternoon to you, sir. Good afternoon, Neil. And one of the things that has actually changed around is that wind direction's a little headwind now. It's really weird. That shifted in the last half an hour to the other way. And that's going to be complex because it was a really heavy tailwind earlier today and it's now a little headwind, so... You got me diving out of it. It is. Well, I just, I, I just... Craig Lowndes and I just looked at the flags in behind there, and as you can see, basically, it is a bit swirly, but it's running back the other way. It's actually coming up off Bass Strait. Well, watch that turn Bass into a track for a few of them, because yeah. uh, even when I was up there before, only like 10, 15 minutes ago, I looked over the opposite mm -hmm. area in the main straight on Gardner Strait, and it was still generally from the northwest and west at that point, so that's an interesting one. And uh, the teams largely have data on that as Mark Winterbottom joins the field. But they need to be on top of it because it will change the behaviour of the car everywhere, but <laughs> notably into one exactly. out of the last corner when there's, when there's a crosswind on there, you know about it. So looking forward to this session, mainly because at the end of it, we'll run a line through the top 10 and we'll pick that top 10 cars and drivers up and we'll drop them into the second portion of Armour All Qualifying. They get a free card, free kick. They jump out of Q1. Sometimes I reckon that's good. Sometimes I think that could be bad, depending on whether the track condition changes. But it means a little less mileage and something of a free kick. So that'll be the focus near the end of it. We'll get a bit of an understanding in the not too distant future as to who's got pace and who hasn't. These guys early in the day were having a real battle trying to find the sweet spot for Jamie Wincup, the driver who's had a pile of success at this location. And he's not been happy. He wasn't happy last weekend. Just didn't get that car anywhere near to his satisfaction. Six poles, five wins, 15 podiums at this location. He was in and out of the garage in the first practice session earlier in the day, trying to come up with the right combination of componentry to make him settled in that cockpit. Yeah, it's weird. When I went down and spoke to David Couchy, they've got full head scratching material going because the tire quality they had was from Newcastle last year. They didn't put another set of tyres on. And then what they've got is balance inconsistency. So the issue around that is that you often 
think, OK, I've got a bit of understeer, I'll fix the front of the car, and if I've got a bit of oversteer, I'll fix the back of the car. But when you've got understeer and oversteer, that is cause for concern. And it's hard then to prioritise which corner you should really look at. A lot of the drivers were complaining about understeer there at that corner, at the final corner in the previous session. But as we said, it had a really significant tailwind and a big long run down in this beautiful front straight and into turn one we love that corner and the images off bass straight this is one of the nicest days i've ever seen at phillip island crumpo you and i've been here a thousand days but it's it's absolutely gorgeous 995 of those have been a little less than nice I know, Just looking at the Dunlop flag there, it's straight off Bass Straight no, you're, you're right, you're 100%. And as soon as you started talking about it, I half poked my head out of the commentary box and it caught me by surprise. That thing was hard on the hard cut on the run to turn four there, Chaz Mostert's car. But that'll be a tailwind now, won't it? So that's the transition, that's actually faster in that zone. And this one, often you don't really think about it, but the tailwind off the water through the hay shed makes the cars five or six k faster takes it where it used to be flat and it's now not flat when you're 5 or 6k faster. Well, as you know, it's right on the teetering edge and you kind of got to use the little curb on the right as a bit of a platform to hook the car. Mistime it slightly or if the tyres are a bit sad late in their life, then you, you know, engineers say, did you get through there flat? Oh, oh yeah. yeah. And turn the wrong trace. <laughs> no, maybe not. <laughs> it's called life preservation. <laughs> David Couchy on the radio engineer for Jamie Wincup. The fastest driver out there at the moment is Chas Mostert, 31.6. From his teammate Cam Waters, 31.9. It's frightening how aligned our brains are on <laughs> some of those sentences, isn't it? <laughs> it's a bit weird. Black record here, Scott McLaughlin, a 1 minute 31 to the quality record. Bright shiny new tyres, McLaughlin in 2017, 21, a correction, 29-0, 29 flat basically, and the practice records are 29.5. 2017 was a fast year. Di Pasquale's proving that there was no fluke in that last session. He's just moved up 14 spots into position number three. I wouldn't mind betting because, remember, he did a 31-3 in the previous session to be fastest. I wouldn't mind betting that Deep Squally's tyres, they might be the same. Because I reckon this afternoon it'll be slower. The headwind makes it slower. He's off the road there, turn four, running too deep into Honda. But the other part that's significant is the UV through the course of the day will definitely come up. And the TCM cars were out before us. So often that actually knocks the track grip around. Deep Squally ran very wide down there at four that time. Back in the really old days, as Andre Heimgartner has a big lock-up in the same area at Turn 4, if you go straight ahead here and then round the U-turn and back out the other side, that's where the track once was before the big rebuild. And uh, the place was resheeted and restructured in that area, and that was just the only area that got changed from its original 1950s layout. Yeah, so the place opened it in 56 and it got the refurb in 88. So we watch Mostert, who uses all the road, Everybody was talking about this line and all the drivers basically complained about understeer there. Pretty impressive running by Mostert. He's on a 31.65, last lap was a 31.76, so that's very good consistency for Chaz. Murph? Yeah, just on that question you asked before there, uh, Scapey, about Andrew Pasquale. Yes, he was, uh, he's still on those, oh, sorry, he's on the tyres, you're right, he finished on the last session, so uh, running around there at the moment. Um, where is he at the moment, boys? Yeah, he's still in fourth position, and then David Reynolds has just rolled now. Uh, he's done actually a pretty good job, because the time he has at the moment was on the tyres, he ran through the whole of practice one. He's only just now changed and put a second set on to go and get a reference on with the number nine, so uh, pretty good for the Penrite Racing guys. Yeah, so that's interesting, isn't it, Greg? Because that's essentially a second slower. So the track, day on day, time for time, Di Pasquale with a 32-1-4 plays a 31-3-1. So it's a long way away. It's at least eight tenths of a second away. And that will be contributed by the wind direction, the UV, and off the road goes Tim Slade. Pretty easy to overrun that corner. He won't be the Lone Ranger on that move for the weekend. Get it stopped. Oh, gee, I think when he ran it through there, he was trying to get out of the gravel trap, but then all of a sudden the old tyre walls, he started to emerge a bit too fast. Very easy to lock a, a wheel here. So it started with a left front locking and then understeer, understeer, 10k too fast, off. 
You can see the smoke signals. There was a bit of Morse code involved in all that on both sides of the front. And when he locked that left front, that started it. And then he tried to gas it up to get it out the other side of the gravel. And that almost pitched him into the tyre wall down there. Hello, <laughs> Bradley. <laughs> he didn't spend any money there, so settle down. Yeah, he's, so he's got seven one hundredths of a second per cat over Chaz Mostert. Tim Slade, who was just on cameras in position four, his lap that he'd only just completed was a good one. His middle sector was the best that we've seen so far. Everybody's had their first burst. About two thirds of the field or thereabouts have come in. Have a think about it. Maybe make a change. Make a comment about what they can feel. It's Brad's son, Macaulay Jones, on screen here in the cool drive entry as well. Car number twenty-one. This is a different chassis to the one that was. Wadded up in Adelaide. Wadded, wadded up. Pretty much what it If you saw it, did you see it at the end of it? I did see it, but it wasn't for explaining. Wadded up. It's wadded a technical up. term for didn't look flash. <laughs> it was ready for recycling. Had that used look. <laughs> Young Macaulay actually likes this place. On debut here in Formula Ford, he qualified on the front row of the grid. Cam's Rising Star program that he was part of with young Jack LeBrock. Oh, oh there's Mark and Neil still parked on the outside. We've moved our location. We've gone to Siberia. Grass is greener there. It's a nice picnic spot. That's a great shot, isn't it? Uh, that's just one of the all-time corners there. We call it Hayshed because of what's on the outside of that corner. If you get it wrong, you'll literally, you literally run right through the middle of the Hayshed down there. But, uh, that is a beautiful racetrack layout in that particular location. Alistair McFain's the engineer. The best part about it is it's just a massive challenge. It's just not an easy corner to deal with and you've got to try and just get the balance of the car right. Even that last corner, there's a whole bunch of challenges at this racetrack. That last corner is tricky to negotiate because of the gear change that occurs right in the middle of it. David's gone to the top on a 1-5. A few members in that club in the earlier session and in this one it seems to be a happy number, doesn't it? Well, there's three cars there within one tenth of a second at the moment. Reynolds, Percat, Mostert. As we're watching Richie Stanaway, when you said about that corner being a challenge, I reckon there's another 11. There's not an easy corner on this whole layout, Andrew. Yeah, Mark, uh, I heard Neil make a comment there about everybody going out doing three laps. SVG came in, they made a front spring and damper change to that car and a rear spring and damper change at the same time. So whatever direction they went, he wasn't happy with it. Yeah, well, sometimes what you do with it is the balance might actually be all right, but you actually do purposely decide on a softer or a stiffer platform. And normally at this place, for qualifying, a stiffer platform works because you want all the grip and you've got to be able to use the new tyre up properly. But as a race car, normally a stiffer tyre, lo stiffer car loads the tyre in a different way and hurts the tyre. So that actually flies in the face of the tyre degradation and tyre wear at this style of layout. There's a big disparity between a good qualifying car and a good race car. David Reynolds is actually going to go faster on his second lap here. So he's done a 31.55. He's done the fastest sector one split. McLaughlin's fastest in the second sector and Cam Waters is fastest in sector three. And he just improved with a 31.49. So Percat and Mostert remain there. Cam Waters, Slade, Golding, Pie, Coltard, De Pasquale and Wing Cup. That's your current 10. McLaughlin's lap is looking like it's going to put him in. In fact, it did. I was going to say close to the top. One minute, 31.3. The point one two of a second over David Reynolds. Great rear end shot of the sliding Castrol Nissan of Rick Kelly. He's down in 18th at the moment. One spot behind his teammate Andre Heimgartner. Lots of games at play here. Even if you were satisfied with the car, going back to and P2 there for Rick, Good job. even if you're satisfied with it, it doesn't mean that you won't just keep on experimenting because there's a couple of things to do. One is trying to establish the best possible one lap car that you can. The other is what's it like over the journey. Plus, you never stop mining for more information. So if there's another set of dampers, there's another spring, an anti-roll bar combination, all of the different things that we talk about in great detail, then you need to try it now in practice so that you can potentially apply it later in the weekend. There's just this never-ending hunger for data 
and uh, that's why the drivers will try and quarantine the remarks into better, worse, no change. Go out, do a quick assessment, no, nah, it's rubbish, get it off, or no, nah, hang on, there's something in this, let's just keep pursuing it. They're looking for little leads, little glimmers of hope, and if they feel that there's a hundred <laughs> here or there, they'll go like... There's no tomorrow to try and exploit it. Well, then you're trying to get an extension of that, aren't you? So if you go a little bit softer and goes faster, you go again. What's the next step of that? So that's what you'll often see is in the garage, a change that's made, it makes a gain or a loss, and you go one way or the other. So McLaughlin with a 31.36, Rick Kelly a 31.38, David Reynolds with a 31.49. Three different brands, 0.12 of a second in a over 90 second lap. It's just under four and a half kilometres this place and that is incredibly close in terms of margin. Fabian Coulthard now down at MG. It's the slowest corner on the track and you sort of sacrifice the exit. Don't use all of the road on the left so that you can get the car turned for this important left-hander. It's a big long corner. It really hurts the tyre. Turn 11 and then you turn it in. It's got a dip in the middle of turn 12 and you run right out to the outside and Use that Vallelunga sawtooth curb. Fabian on that lap did a 31.82. That's his personal best. He's currently in eighth position and he's 0.45 of a second away. So the top 10 right now is separated by 0.65. That will definitely reduce. And as I said at the start of this session, there was a lot of head scratching going on with this car and the vagaries of balance and the different style of corner and the different things that Jamie was reporting as a consequence of understeer in some places, oversteer in others. Will Davison did a good job at the end of the last session. He ended up second. Lynn Cup has gone to the pit. Still 14 as they try and unlock the mysteries of the setup world at Phillip Island. Will Davison's run in this year, generally speaking, has been very strong. So he was pretty quick there early in that other session, previous session. So he's moved up 13 spots now into 10th. I think um, Phil Monday's move to bring that outfit inside Tickford Racing has been a really positive one. He's had a couple of wins at this location, Will Davison, as we go back to James Courtney. They were just going to go out in this session, try a little less wing on this car to just see whether they could get it to balance up a bit better. High speed understeer was the Ooh. thing that they were most concerned about. Has he got it now? No. He said as the <laughs> rear of the car was wriggling nervously through his shed. That was far from understeer. <laughs> Maybe put just a whisker of wing back on it. Well, and also the thing that trips you up is the tailwind. So that's the aspect of play that builds another set of circumstances and you, you arrive there faster, plus you have a different aerodynamic effect based on the wind. There's the number of the gear number. And what you do now is grab the outside, you grab fifth to minimize the slide. So importantly, that gear change actually tries in a weird way to catch the car and bring it back. Have a look at this, nice car control. A bit of that came from the rattling on the curb on the inside. And uh, this is complete contrast, the slow speed run into MG and really easy to lock that inside front there when all the weight of the car rolls to the left, the right front wants to protest. Davison in from 10th position. All of the Mustangs are in the top 10 at the moment. McLaughlin's the fastest, Mostert is fifth, then Waters is sixth, Fabian, uh, correction, Lee is seventh, Fabian's eighth, and uh, Will Davison's in 10th. Nick Perkett just spent a little bit of time in the garage for a bit of attention to that car. Uh, he wanted a new spring and damper combination. New, usually we see that happen pretty quickly, but Nick actually wanted a new spring, or whether it was Nick or Andrew Edwards, wanted a new spring for the same damper, so the boys had to make up a new combination for him. So he's just been pushed out with that new update to his car, as well as a ride height change. Yeah, well, that adds some complexity when you've got to actually take the spring off the old shock absorber unit and then reassemble it and then also make a ride height change as a consequence so they're all time consuming avenues for the technicians to get that car back out so we're about to see some fun we're about 11 and a half minutes away from the end of this session remembering the top 10 practice two will go through to q2 in this 
qualifying format we have for Armour or Pole. Andrew? Fine story. Scott McLaughlin's been really strong here in the past. We've documented that well. Do you put as much emphasis on Friday, knowing how strong he is here, to buy you a ticket into the top ten tomorrow? Well, he can't do the job if we don't give him the car, so we have to focus on that side of things and make sure that he's comfortable in it. And the feedback we're getting from both of our guys at the moment is very similar. Fabian's experiencing it to a little greater extreme than, the, than Scott is, so we're tuning around a couple of factors at the moment. We're also, also facing a bit of a headwind into Turn 1, which, of course, affects every at the same time as well so there's a couple of uh, variable factors at play here but uh, for us right now it's about getting the car right and of course making sure we're in the top 10 at the end of this session thanks ryan thanks to you andrew jones with ryan's story that wind that ryan just spoke about now that you've drawn my attention to it and uh, i can there's a flag just sort of uh, a couple of hundred meters from where i'm it's actually picked up even since you mentioned it so definitely a little change in the air there at the moment and for Ryan to be talking about it, then the drivers will be making that comment, and you'll see it. It hurts it here, so the headwind, when the front of the car comes off that particular corner, it hurts it. It hurts the terminal speed down into turn one. It affects the turn in and the mid corner at turn two. It's a tailwind then into turn four. It affects the car a lot on the way up into the hay shed and around up into Lukey Heights. Red flag. So 10 minutes remaining. Red flag, I wonder what that's for. Could be our friends that don't fly that well. There's the aero, there you go. If you would, you know how you're a bit of an aero guru? <laughs> would that be a good aero device or a bad aero device? Stood the test of time. You mean same spec? Same spec. It's not like a, there's no Boeing action. No tweaking. Cam's race control moving right along. Uh, they're the ones that have got the full visibility on everything going on around the track at the moment. See how I sidestep so, that. So you're saying that the old spec is pretty good still? Still working fine. They do a lot of walking. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> Top 10's the focus here. McLaughlin is the fastest. Will Davison is 10th. The spread between them is 5 tenths of a second. And the top 10 get lifted up and dropped into the second portion of Armour All Qualifying. So there'll be a focus on this. This comes at a slightly awkward time. 10 minutes remaining. Remember, a big long lap here. Minute and a half a lap, plus the in and out of a very long pit lane entry, transition and exit. So um, you'll eat up those 10 minutes pretty quickly. Not a lot of laps left out there. So they need to make hay when they do go back out with the green flag to try and make sure that they can be a part of the 10. While we've got this red flag, I'm going to try and do my best here to explain a bit of this aero and balance effect that we keep talking about across the two practice sessions. So aero, what, a, what affects it is this front splitter here when some force goes down onto that. And then if we come up the back of the car, there's obviously the rear wing. I'm going to sneak through here, sorry, mate. Rear wing on the back. Front and rear wing work together. And they actually, when they combine, we end up with an aero pressure point. I'm going to stick in here. It's up around this part. So when they make an adjustment to the rear wing there, when it goes to maximum, it shifts that pressure point in the car, changes the balance, and that's what we keep hearing about. We need to make that balance suit the guy that sits in the driver's seat here. Once they reach maximum wing, they can adjust the rear ride height here, which changes the rake. If they go up in the rear, it shifts that aero pressure point forward on the car and makes the car turn harder. Likewise, when they drop the back of the car, it makes it more settled. Hopefully they do the job for Will here, and we can get him further up the grid. Thanks for the update there, Andrew. It looks like you're right in the thick of it there. <laughs> and uh, Brendan Hogan's the engineer on that car. He had his race face on, getting Will ready to go back out, and they've rolled him back out. There you go. I'd like to put you in that. <laughs> That's what I'd like to put you in. <laughs> You'd love that. That's your go. Is that your biggest fan? <laughs> <laughs> it's my only. <laughs> what a classic day. Have you ever seen a more beautiful day at Phillip Island? No, it is really absolutely Stunning. gorgeous here at the moment in the low 20s. For a mid-April day, absolutely glorious, and uh, you could almost water ski out there on Bass Strait. A little replay here on board with Rick Kelly, and uh, he ordered one of something. Yeah, not sure what he was ordering. I don't think he's too happy there somewhere. So this is going to be great. Eight minutes 50 remaining. It will have changed everyone's schedule there. That red flag has just put a little vagary into the end of this session. Do people, were people already on schedule to change tyres? Probably not quite yet. 
It's a big long lap to warm the tyre up. It is important to phase the tyre and get the front tyre in for turn one. It's hard to make the left hand front tyre accurate enough when you first turn it into turn one because it's effectively the cold, lazy side when you get down there. So it gets almost superheated by the time you get through the fast turn one at roughly 210 k. You arrive there at 285. So it's not one that you can be half-hearted with. It's a real commitment corner. And at the moment, we've got a 31.36 for McLaughlin. On the cusp of the top 10 is Will Davison with a 31.92. So everyone will be looking to bounce past the 31s, and there'll be a couple that'll make it into the 30s, I would think. So that's just a tiny bit slower for McLaughlin than the fastest time in that first session. But it's the best time that McLaughlin's achieved so far. Coming up to seven and a half minutes remaining in this session now. The vast majority of the top ten are still in the garage area or in the pit lane. Wincup's on a good lap. His first sector is the best we've seen of anybody out there. So they might finally have unlocked the missing link in this car and uh, Shane Van Gisbergen on screen. So he's had great success here too. If you cast your mind back a year ago, this was the location where, remember, he had the steering drama, the power steering yep. fail? Yep. And it was intermittent, so one Whoa. minute he would. That was intermittent, that slide. You know, one minute he would have huge steering loads required and then it kicked back in and he had to settle back down. It's an odd weekend for Red Bull because it was also the weekend where Jamie flicked off the pit lane speed limiter too early and that cost him in that battle. He had a wonderful battle with Scott McGonagall. He's done a nice sector two also, wing cup. So this might be our first indication of better tyre speed, six and a half minutes remaining. And when Andrew was talking about aero balance, we're basically talking about how much front and rear aero you have and where the centre of pressure is. But there's also a lot to do with mechanical balance here. What front and rear spring you use, what geometry you use, and a 31-2-3 for Wink Cup. Comes up 14 spots. I just want to confirm what, uh, for you guys up there, that wasn't a green run, so that was just a better used one for Jamie Wink Cup. A green set is sitting here ready for him, which I expect he'll be on the car very shortly, as for Shane Van Gisbergen, who's just arrived back in the garage. That's not a bad time then, Greg. Thanks for the update. One, two. I was watching Jamie's hands at the final corner. They didn't move. He turned in once, held the position, progressed the throttle and wound the steering lock off. That's a little bit more like the poise we've seen in that car earlier. So that looked like a shiny set of Dunlop soft tyres, the harder of the two variations. Going on to the Shelby Power Racing Team entry. So it's about to get pretty energised here. Coming up to the five minute mark. Practice to WD-40 Phillip Island Super Sprint. James Courtney comes off the racetrack into the pit lane. It's about 43 odd seconds to make the run into that pit lane entry and then transit the lane, excluding the time it takes to put fuel and tyres into and on the car. About two thirds of the competitors in pit lane now. As you said, just over five minutes remaining, we're gonna see some Better tyres, the green tyre, the brand new shiny version of our Dunlop control tyre. There's Boston going out here, that's a green tyre. You can see the shiny surface, the mould release that's on that slick tyre version. And as you said, it's the harder of our variants and the hard tyre actually works pretty well here. We call it compound suitability as Jack LeBrock departs Lukey Heights in car 19 for truck assist techno racing. That's a big off. That's a very fast section of road. Oh, locks the left front, can't steer it. Carried it a long time. And that will have hurt that tyre. That's right out past the gravel. Was able to get to the grass. It's a really narrow race line there. And once you do lock a brake, the, it just takes no time at all to basically end up off the road. We've seen a couple of big moments there over the years. So I reckon you're right, there'll be a big chance that when he gets back on the racetrack, it's thump, 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 back through the steering wheel. Four minutes remaining now. Is that green tyre, Did you see that one there? Uh, yeah, I think it was. Yeah. So I keep getting reports through that uh, pretty much everybody's going to have a run on their greens here, which would be customary. And here, you know how much a tyre yields in lap speed for you. Now, I want to keep an eye, because on... Final quarter at the moment at 12. 
and you'll see arrive in the background. This is a committed lap with the headlights on now for McLaughlin and he's got to find his way into traffic and Coulthard's with him. So these guys have started their lap fully committed. How far does he get in here? He's got a little bit of headwind to help. See those white scuff marks on the road where the splitters are bottoming out, the front wings are touching the road. Turn two, if you lock the inside front there, you're off the road and in the gravel in a heartbeat. Last year, he was surgical in his manoeuvres here at Turn 2, Southern Loop. He'll be flat through three. Listen to this. Seven thousand five hundred revs. That engine has got no more to give in that location. It's back to second gear. And there's that added security of just touching the ripple strip on the inside, and he's done the best first sector split of anybody so far. Traffic could well be a factor because Heimgarten is warming up in front of him. Meantime, it's full missile lock for McLaughlin at the moment. He's committed. He needs space to complete the lap. We'll get a reading in the second portion of the lap in just a moment. He was 100% flat. Does the traffic compromise? Nice. No, they did a great job. Well, well done. done to both those competitors for giving space when it was required. This could be our first 30 based on that number. Oh, he just ran it into MG a little bit too high and wide. He was a little fast when he turned it in. That won't cost too much in a slow corner like that. Here we go. What's... Yeah, he turns it in early. That's a nice approach. He's picked up fifth gear very early. This is going to be roughly a mid-30. This is our first indication of real speed for McLaughlin. And he does a 30.18. Great job. And Fabian's just got him. A 30.1807. There's six one thousandths between 12 and 17. Holdsworth has gone into position number three. Tremendous speed, 30.1s from both the Shell V-Power Racing Team entries of McLaughlin and Coulthard with Fabian on screen on top. Now, McLaughlin lost a tiny bit of ground at MG. Yep. He just ran it in a little bit quick, but the rest of the lap, in fact, in the first and third sectors, he was supreme. Wow, Hazelwood, great job. Up 16 spots, 30.8 fastest Commodore, Todd Hazelwood. It's faster than Jamie Winker. We're inside a minute and a half now, practice two. It's easy to get carried away looking at the fastest times, but remember the top 10 carry through. Rick Kelly's just been supreme here last year and now this. He's moved up into third position. A one minute 30.6 for the Nissan driver. Holdsworth is going on with it. He's done the best first sector of anybody that we've seen. Will Davison's down in uh, 12th position at the moment. So you've got to do better than a 31.6 to get into the 10, which takes you into Q2, remember that. So Will Davison comes up eight spots with a 30.64. Now Cam Waters comes up nine spots with a 30.44. Nick Perker comes up three spots to come into ninth. Winkup and Reynolds now are 10th and 11th. What's Winkup got for us? Di Pasquale comes up seven spots to seventh. Wind Cup at the moment is in 11th position. Per Cat is in this 10 that we're focused on. There are still quite a few people to complete their laps. Here's the Mobile One Mega Fuels cars. Scott Pye in the foreground and Courtney behind him. Yeah, they're down at 16th and 17th. So Wind Cup's 11th. He is on a pretty good lap. It's a personal Can best lap for him, but he's about four or five tenths away. Now, Van Gisbergen is 21st, but he's on a good lap. His time in the first sector, Wincup gets to 10th. Gizzy's time in the first sector is pretty close to Holdsworth, who was the fastest. So Van Gisbergen at the moment, looking like he might get stronger here. He's about to go over the top of the rise in the background behind Will Davison at Lukey Heights. So is he, he the only one? You reckon? of him here. Do you think he's the only one? I'm looking there, Winterbottom's on a lap, but it's not good enough. His first sector's not very good. So Van Gisbergen might actually displace his teammate. 30.94 now is your 10. You've got to do better than a 30.94. What will Van Gisbergen do? He's coming onto the straight now. So his sector splits don't look too bad. It's going to move him up, but it is not enough. He gets it to does. the 10th position and he displaces Wind Cup in the process. So the youngsters, Di Pasquale and Hazelwood, have gone quicker than the Red Bull Holden Racing Team cars. So Hazelwood is a triple eight spec built car. Remember that he's moved to the ZB Commodore this year. 
And that car is the fastest of the triple eight cars. Todd Hazelwood in eighth, faster than Van Gisbergen and Winkup. Unprecedented. Nice job, Fabian Coulthard. That was a good, uh, good lap time, wasn't it? A one minute 30.1807 for him. Sorry, I say unprecedented. That's not the case because that was the same at Adelaide. On the Sunday, Hazelwood was the fastest of the Triple Eight cars, so he's done a really good job, the young bloke from South Africa. South, South Africa, <laughs> South Australia. Um, Ryan Story in the white shirt in the background. In the other white shirt, you can see there next to Mark Fenning in the centre is Shreeram Packham. He's the aerodynamicist for Ford Performance based in Dearborn, Detroit, so he's had a hand in the design of the Mustang. There's practice two confirmation for you and nice speed being shown by Coulthard and McLaughlin. One minute, 30.1 between them, six one thousandths of a second. Waters third, followed then by Rick Kelly. He'll be heartened by that. They weren't sure whether or not it was all tyres that did it in that previous session, practice one. Uh, looking further afield, these are the drivers that uh, don't progress into the second part of Armour All Qualifying. They'll have to duke it out in the first portion of qualifying tomorrow. That's the reason why the names are dulled off at the moment. Macaulay Jones, 2.8 seconds to find. Let's get to Greg. Yeah, pretty calm and collected in here. Shell V Power Racing, Fabian Coulthard, great job. You absolutely smashed your teammate there. Six oh, thousand of us smashed them. <laughs> hey, look, it's good that we've got two fast cars. That's the main thing. So um, it's hard to know really where you're at when, um, you know, the Triple Eight Holden's not there. So. Um, yeah, we'll just have to go through everything tonight and see if we can make it better. Yeah, I mean, I was watching you there, sort of wincing and moving your head around when you're talking to Mark Fenning about it. And clearly, clearly, there's there's a lot of areas that you still got to look at. That's far from being a, a perfect lap uh, based on your body language. Exactly. It's um, this is one of those tracks that you find a little bit, you find a lot. Um, so I'm not 100% happy. I don't think you're ever 100% happy. So. Um, yeah, we can make it better. Ryan sort of indicated during the session too that, uh, you know, it's been a couple of hours since the last session and there's been a little bit of a wind change. This place changes so much really, really easily. Yeah. I mean, it sounded like that the cars had actually changed down into Turn 1, a little bit more understeer than what you had in the first session. Yeah, I noticed the surf was up on the outside of the track, so uh, obviously the wind's blowing up a little bit. But, um, no, it obviously does change uh, uh, quite a lot here. Um, just needs to switch a little bit and, and it can transform the way the car performs. So. You definitely got to be on your game. Thanks, man. Cheers. Jamie, you just spent an extended period of time looking at the timing screen there. P11. What are your thoughts going on at the moment? Yeah, disappointed. Disappointed. We want to be in the 10. We, we push pretty hard. Um, only 100th by my teammate. <laughs> so that sucks. He just, just uh, knocked me out at the end there. So um, that's okay. That's, that's, that's the way it goes. We'll, um, we'll keep fighting on. But um, we've got Todd Hazelwood up there, you know, in, in my car from last year. So. Um, those guys are doing a better job than we are at the moment, so um, we've got to play a finger out. One of the things we see from you is in this sort of a period, you dig deep. What are you looking for? Um, as far as pay, oh yeah, gee, mate, we're just looking for front and rear, you know, we're just looking for grip all around. So um, uh, yeah, we've got, we've got some work to do, but um, that's, that's all good, it's all good. Righto, thanks, Jeremy. Right, Todd Hazelwood, I know it's probably hard to get excited because it's practice, but it <laughs> means a lot at this weekend. Yeah, definitely. You know, we probably didn't expect that result going into that session. We had a you know, although 11th and P1, we put new tyres on it to try and see what the car was doing. And thankfully we did because it gave us a bit of a read of what to do with the car then. And yeah, we got it really hooked up. It was good. Look at the timesheets. Todd Hazelwood, he finishes above Jamie Winkup, <laughs> Shane Van Gisbergen. And Jamie just referenced the fact that you guys in his old car has done a better job. Yeah, well, they, uh, they gave us all the ingredients to do a good job in the first place. So it's, uh, it's good to be able to work closely with those guys. Obviously, you know, for it to be a two-way relationship where, you know, they're faster than us and we learn, and when we're faster than them, they can learn off us. So, yeah, it's a, it's a really cool thing that we've got going there. And, yeah, I think, uh, you know, to be one of the couple Holdens in the top ten is really special for a little team like Matt Stone Racing. That's great, Todd. Cheers. Thank you. Finding his way uh, into the first phase of qualifying tomorrow, Dave Reynolds, 14th. I know. What's going on? It's not a good number, is it? It's not not pleasant, but um, yeah, my car didn't feel too bad. We run a, uh, a you know, different batch allocation um, than we'd use this weekend, so I don't know if it's a bit of that or I don't really know. Did, did it feel use... did it feel faster when you're in the car, or did you, were you worried when you started your lap? I was worried when I started my lap. Just didn't turn the fronts on, had heaps understeer, and I don't know. But if 
I think if my electric time or my rolling lap might be okay, so it just depends on, we'll have to look at the data a bit better. Is it such a bad thing being how much this place does change? Yes, tyre management is really, really critical, and you've only got a certain amount of them, but uh, tomorrow will be very, very different. We know this place changes so much the cars. Going into that first phase, is it necessarily a bad thing? Not at all. It can actually help you, um, especially around here, because you know, just from session one to session two today, the wind the wind swung around, so the car handles vastly different to it did this morning. So, um, you know, that that could probably help us. Thanks, man. No worries. Thanks. So David Reynolds trying to see the positives in not winning through to Q2 for qualifying tomorrow. Do you agree with him? Do you think, given how changeable the weather conditions can be here at Phillip Island, that that may actually serve him well? I don't know if it'll serve him well. I think it actually has given drivers a challenge. And we spoke about this before the qualifying, or sorry, the practice session leading into qualifying, that, that this circuit particularly does buffet and move cars around. So you've got to take a very, very keen eye on how, not only how strong the wind is, but the direction of the wind. And we did talk about it from practice one to practice two, it completely went 180. So whether that hurt Davy Reynolds, but look, Anton got the job done. So you've got to say that, uh, you know, they've got the cars to be able to be in the 10. Surprising like, you know, some of the people that have missed the 10, but that's why I love this format because it does throw up a whole new ball game now of who now is now has to go through Q1 to get into Q2. How was that Van Gisberg and displaced wind cut right there at the end? That's not a good sign. He wasn't happy about that <laughs> oh, either. I'm sure he wouldn't be. I'm a very below average loser he is at that stage. And then uh, Todd Hazelwood, how was that? That was fantastic. Unbelievably That's good the job. second time this year that he's he's done what that, being not not almost the fastest Holden, yeah. but outdone that, that umbrella of Triple Eight. Good job. Yeah, very good job. And that'll give him so much confidence heading into tomorrow, uh, won't it? So what does Jamie Winkup do? to tune that car up? How do they find some more speed? Well, I think when we were talking about it before and we said that it was struggling for balance and balancing consistency, nothing is worse than that around here because if you've got one end of the car that's a problem, then you can go ahead and fix it. But when you've got a combination of understeer and oversteer, and because there's all this transition between aero grip 